successful in 1968. Today, in the year 2001, we have to assume that nuclear propulsion systems are very, very advanced. But there's another problem. So far to date, most nuclear uh, reaction systems that have been developed are very, very radioactive. Earlier I was talking about deuterium helium-3 fusion developed by Bogdan Castle Magwitch from MIT and how that project produced a non-radioactive 18 million electron volt charge and how that could be applied to not only powering space stations but also um, driving the ion generators and ion propulsion systems for very, very spa fast space um, travel. But that system didn't get developed. So looking at how radioactive nuclear power sources are, we would expect if one of these vehicles were flying around our skies that the astronauts would have to wear tremendous shielding in the form of a spacesuit to protect them from severe levels of radiation. But yet if anyone had ever actually encountered one of these craft on their own, they would be exposed to high levels of radiation. So we, we, we would need evidence, evidence of that fact. There are many evidence in many cases like that. Betty and Barney Hill, both people who were um, witnesses to a UFO um, event. They actually saw UFOs, they claim, and they actually have documented severe radiation burns on their body. Betty Cash, in 1980 in Texas, saw a UFO and pursued it, came into close proximity of this UFO. She received severe, severe radiation burns for which she was hospitalized. Um, back in, in uh, 1998, she died. No one knows for certain whether she died of, of the severe radiation burns that she received, but we do know that she received severe radiation burns. Now, if we're going to make a distinction between an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft and an actual alternative space program space vehicle, this is where we would make our distinction. We can't assume that someone traveling from Alpha Centauri or Sirius coming here and traveling for 8.7 years would expose their bodies to high levels of radiation. They, they would die long before they even got here. So what the signature of, of one of these radioactive vehicles would be would be exactly like what happened to, to Betty Cash. And I think there are many other documented cases out there where people have encountered UFOs and received radiation burns. So it might be a signature. It might be an answer pointing to the possibility that, that we have developed very, very advanced spacecraft, and we do have what may be UFOs in our own uh, space programs, but somehow it hasn't really leaked out to the public. The power of accurate observation is commonly called cynicism by those who have not got it. George Bernard Shaw. So at this point in my investigation, I was beginning to not trust NASA. I was not really happy with the answers to the questions I sent them. And I detected they knew a lot more that they weren't telling me. So I decided to use the Freedom of Information Act request against Dr. Joseph Newt III and request that all files on this subject be delivered to me so that I could look deeper into it. The letter he wrote me back on February 24th, 1999, Dear Mr. Sarita, Enclosed with this letter is my entire file on the matter in question, including the videotape that you so kindly sent to me for my comments. I did not send copies of my email replies to your previous email messages, as I infer from the content of this present letter that you retain your own copies of this correspondence. Since I'm not at all interested in the speculations of Dr. Lou Frank, and since my own research interests do not involve the data sets upon which these speculations are based. I have no other information on these matters other than that enclosed, all of which was sent by you. Signed, Dr. Joseph A. Newt III, Head, Astrochemistry Branch. P.S. Thanks for the great stamps. I had not seen anything like them previously. So at this point, Dr. Newt is saying that there is no other file at NASA, that my investigation that I'm conducting is the only file and the only investigation being done into this phenomena at NASA. I didn't know whether to believe it, but I didn't want to pursue him any further on that particular question, and I wanted to move on with our dialogue and see how much deeper I could go into this investigation. Later, I would have to try to contact Dr. Louis A. Frank myself and try to get a dialogue going with him. On February 25th, 1996, on Space Shuttle Mission Number STS-75, 
NASA launched a possible breakthrough energy technology experiment. They launched a 12 mile long electrical conductor cable called an electrodynamic tether designed to collect high energy electrons in the Earth's ionosphere and magnetic fields. The motion of the conductor tether across the Earth's magnetic fields induces a voltage along the 12 mile length of the tether. Utilizing estimates and the charge densities of the Earth's magnetic fields and the ionosphere, the voltage produced is expected to be up to several hundred volts per kilometer. If successful, the experiment could produce a lot of electrical power. If additional power is driven along the tether in the opposite direction to that which it normally wants to flow, the tether, in theory, could push creating propulsion against the Earth's gravity to raise the shuttle's orbit. The advantage to this revolutionary technology in propulsion is that it does not require any rocket fuel. If successful, electrodynamic tethers could prove a way to greatly reduce the cost of in-space propulsion. For example, the International Space Station could keep itself in orbit, saving nearly $2 billion in orbital reboost rocket fuel for every 10 years of the station's operations. But on February 25th, after the 12-mile tether began producing electricity, an unexpected overload of electrical energy fluctuating between 2 and 10 times that predicted due to inaccurate estimates in the electrical charge of the Earth's magnetic fields, ionosphere, and possibly space radiation, fried the tether conductor cable and it broke, severing it from the space shuttle. So the tether has broken at the, uh, at the boom. The tether has broken and is going away from us. Get it on the, get it on the TV, Claude. Please get it on the TV. The tether has broken. Copy. Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite. That, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing a. Uh, The satellite, again, uh, just moving into sunrise, 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is a lot of stray light and is getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. You know that description by the crew, this is uh, the tether in the satellite, uh, the satellite with 12, approximately 12 miles of tether still attached to it. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The two spacecraft are now 90 nautical miles apart. Controllers for the satellite uh, did have communications uh, with it uh, during the close pass uh, between Columbia and the satellite. Columbia Houston, that's a much better view. 